Hi everybody. So, you're not here today because it's an inset day, but I promised you that I'd get some of these put on to film for you guys. So the, um, the poem I'm going to look at now is Kamikaze by Beatrice Garland. It's one of the modern poems, far more recent than some of the others, and it is it's a very interesting story because it looks at a non-British soldier for a start, and it looks at it from the perspective of a, a family member further, further removed than some of the other poems. Now, the word kamikaze is the title, and it literally means divine wind or divine tempest, okay? Now, already we've got a direct comparison here, looking at just the titles alone with Storm on the Island. But what we also have here is we have a bit of, an inf bit of information about the kamikaze pilots themselves, because obviously the word divine meaning sent by God. So we get this impression already that kamikaze pilots were very, very much felt that they were sent um, by a higher power. Now, if we do a little bit of reading into the context of this, we've also got the added idea that um, the emperor of, Ch of um, Japan at the time would have been treated as if he were a god, and some people believe that the emperor was a god. So it's logical to think that divine wind literally means that they have been sent by God. Now, if we take a look at the poem's structure overall, I don't know whether you can see the whole poem from here. It's not particularly strong, but what we can see is that we have a fairly regular structure at the beginning that, tend, that starts to break down towards the end of the poem. And we have two very distinct parts. So we've got a fairly regular stanza structure. And it's broken into two distinct parts. The first section appears to be some form of interview with the daughter of a kamikaze pilot. It's third person, it's uh, removed from the events. The second part is her direct speech. It's first person past tense. Haven't got the right space. And it's it's very, very different voice. Far more emotional, far more um, closely related to the story. And she actually starts speaking Bef um, briefly before we get into that section. So if we go up and have a look at it stanza by stanza, we start with the very first stanza here. Her father embarked at sunrise with a flask of water, a samurai sword in the cockpit, a shaven head full of powerful incantations and enough fuel for a one-way journey into history. So right away with the word her, we recognise that the story is being told by the daughter. We don't know who she's talking to, but it's obviously somebody who is now reporting that information back. So it could be a reporter, it could be somebody talking to variety of different people but we get the idea that this person wants this story known and we get already in the first stanza her, her father embarked at sunrise and we've got some quite positive vocabulary here about um, 
her father and what he's about to do. Obviously, the word sunrise um, implies life and very positive things, but also Japan is near the land of the rising sun. So that implies an awful lot more positive things, again, about the ideas in the poem. So this idea that Japan's a very beautiful country and he's off on his way to embark on something that is effectively life-giving because obviously the sun coming up, bringing life. And then we have these um, interesting things that he takes with him. A flask of water, a samurai sword in the cockpit, a shaven head full of powerful incantations. And, and there's a lot here that implies that he has been trained for this specific thing and got things like the samurai sword Japanese soldier um, well known for the idea of they would rather commit suicide than be captured so the idea of suicide is more honourable than being captured rather than dying without honour. And all of these quite um, powerful things that he's up to. A shaven head full of powerful incantations. And that suggests, again, coming back to that uh, the idea of the kamikaze, the divine wind. This is more than just a job. This is um, a religious vocation. You know, shaven head full of powerful incantations implies that he's actually been prepared for this on a religious basis, a theological basis, rather than just on training. And enough fuel for a one-way journey into history. She sounds really positive about this. I can almost imagine her saying this herself. But we could also look at that as being mildly sarcastic. You know, um, you know real a one-way journey into history. So it's one or the other. But it's interesting that as a child, she knows this is what he's going to do. She knows he is going to die. It's quite an interesting thought, the idea of a child knowing that her father has made this choice and being expected to be really proud of the fact that he's going to die. Now, the next stanza is her thinking about what the choice he made. But halfway there, she thought, recounting it later to her children, he must have looked far down at the little fishing boats strung out like bunting on a green-blue translucent sea. And beneath them, arcing in swathes, like a huge flag, waved first one way, then the other in a figure of eight, the dark shoals of fishes flashing silver as their bellies swivelled towards the sun. So if we go up to the top here, first of all, halfway there, she thought. So this is her perception of it. She never knew. She doesn't actually know, okay? Which, considering what her father actually did, as we find out later in the poem, it's kind of odd, but also kind of explains itself. That whole idea of the fact that, despite the fact he does come back alive, she never spoke to him again, because she, um, she was encouraged to treat him as if he'd never come back. He must have looked down at the little fishing boats, strung out like bunting on a green-blue translucent sea. And we have this beautiful image here. First of all, we've got the little fishing boats, strung out like bunting, that lovely simile suggesting celebration, joy.
that whole idea, the idea that they're celebrating that these kamikaze pilots are going out to go and blow themselves up. And then this beautiful, tranquil scene of the green-blue translucent sea. It's blue, it's calm, it's beautiful. Up against that, um, the idea of the fact that they're celebrating this you know, effectively waste of life, you could argue that this is quite ironic. And beneath them, arcing in swathes like a huge flag, fir waved first one way, then the other in a figure of eight. We've got this kind of patriotic simile going on here. This idea that a flag is what they're following. They go one way, then the other, they follow the flag. The dark shoals of fishes flashing silver as their bellies swiveled towards the sun. And at first thought, when we're, con when we're looking at this, we think, oh yes, must be talking about the fish underneath the sea. And then we think about them flashing silver as their bellies swiveled towards the sun. And we realise that it's a metaphor. It's this whole idea of the fact that the fish are actually the planes. When you think about it, planes in the air, quite sort of, they look very beautiful and graceful in the same way that fish do. And remember how he and his brothers waiting on the shore built cairns of pearl grey pebbles to see whose withstood longest the turbulent inrush of breakers, bringing their father's boat safe, yes, grandfather's boat safe to the shore. I mean, you can't see that, I'm just going to move that down. And so now she's talking about not just her father, but she's also talking about her grandfather. He and his brothers waiting on the shore, built cairns of pearl grey pebbles. They're waiting for their father to return. And the irony of the fact that her father is standing on the shore waiting for his father to come home safe. And she repeats this, and we have her voice for the first time here. Yes, grandfather's boat. It's interesting how she refers to her grandfather as grandfather. Because when we, the only time the words father are mentioned in the poem, we have her father at the top third person reported speech and we have the father she never says my father so it's almost like her grandfather is um more alive to her than her father he is personal her father she really doesn't ever mention by name at all safe to the shore and that alliteration there really pulls that out salt sodden a wash makes it stick out that word safe. That irony, that juxtaposition of those two ideas. Okay. Her father is waiting for her father, um, for grandfather to come home. The idea of life. And when you consider what he actually goes out for, he goes out fishing. And we've got this, you know, the cloud mackerel, very dreamlike, very sort of like not quite memory, isn't it? Black crabs, feathery prawns, the loose silver of white bait. And then a tuna, the dark prince. A whole idea of that hazy memory. 
but it's all life giving, it's food. I mean, even the tuna, which is, you know, described as being dangerous. Still described almost like it's a nightmare. Whereas her father, I'm back up here, she is waiting. Effectively, she's waiting for her father to die. And the irony of that juxtaposition there, it's almost laughable, that whole idea that, you know, grandfather was going out to bring back life for us, food. Her father is going back to bring death to both himself and the enemy. And then we go into this little bit here, which is all in italics, which is her words. And though he came back, my mother never spoke again. And here we have first person address, my mother. Direct speech. My mother never spoke again in his presence, nor did she meet his eyes and the neighbours too. They treated him as though he no longer existed. He has brought shame to them, so that's why they're no longer talking to him. Only we children still chattered and laughed till gradually we too learned to be silent. And it just emphasises this whole idea of the, of the idiocy of this. The children have to learn to be silent. They don't get it. They don't understand at first. To live as though he had never returned, that this was no longer the father we loved. Let's just see again, the father, not my father or our father, but the father. He's no longer the father they loved. Living ghost effectively is the best way I could think of to describe it. He's, he's genuinely treated like he's a ghost, he's not there. And sometimes, she said, so we're now back into that third person section here. She said, he must have wondered which had been the better way to die. And this is the crux of it all. If he had died as a kamikaze pilot, he would have been treated exactly the same way. Life would have carried on without him. And in some respects, he may have actually been treated better. So which is better, the metaphorical death of being shamed and shunned or the actual death? So there's a lot we can say about this poem and a lot of poems we can compare it to. It works very well with poppies. It works very well with um, remains. It works very well with Charge of the Light Brigade, the idea of um, the futility of war. It works very well with exposure, with um, bayonet charge, any of the war poems. And it also works well with the nature poems as well because there's so much natural imagery. Um, there's this whole idea of uh, this blue sea looking down on the sea and the, the kamikaze being a wind itself works very well with Storm on the Island, works very well with the prelude, the whole idea of man versus nature. Um, you could even look at this in comparison to Ozymandias as well. And it also works well with the idea of corruption, the idea of um, people in power taking away 
from those who have little power. You know, if we look at the history, the context of the kamikaze pilots, they were often very young, very inexperienced, and they were being told that they were doing this in order to bring honor to their emperor, bring honor to their families. When in reality, they were basically being a, um, a piloted bomb. And it was used as a technique to scare the, the enemy, the fact that these people were like, I do not care. I am going to throw myself at this thing because, you know, we believe we're right. Terrifying image when you think of the American soldiers that were looking up at these, these pilots coming down on them. And, I mean, I think it's a beautiful poem. It's one of my favorites in the whole section. And it's, it's really sad as well. Okay, so that's that one. Thank you very much.